this morning. Mm -hmm. His final words, the Washington Post published a column that Jamal Khashoggi wrote just days before he disappeared. It's titled, What the Arab World Needs Most is Free Expression, and it reads as follows. We're reading the whole thing here. I was recently online looking at the 2018 Freedom in the World report published by Freedom House and came to a grave realization. There is only one country in the Arab world that has been classified as free. That nation is Tunisia. Jordan, Morocco, and Kuwait come in second with the classification of partly free. The rest of the countries in the Arab world are classified as not free. As a result, Arabs living in these countries are either uninformed or misinformed. They are unable to adequately address, much less publicly discuss, matters that affect the region and their day-to-day -day lives. A state-run narrative dominates the public psyche, and while many do not believe it, a large majority of the population falls victim to this false narrative. Sadly, this situation is unlikely to change. The Arab world was ripe with hope during the spring of 2011. Journalists, academics, and the general popula population were brimming with expectations of a bright and free Arab society within their respective countries. They expected to be emancipated from the hegemony of their governments and the constant, consistent rather, interventions and censorship of information. These expectations were quickly shattered. These societies either fell back to the old status quo or faced even harsher conditions than before. My dear friend, the prominent Saudi writer Salah al Shehi wrote one of the most famous columns ever published in the Saudi press. He unfortunately is now serving an unwarranted five-year prison sentence for supposed comments contrary to the Saudi establishment. The Egyptian government seizure of the entire print run of a newspaper on Masri al yum did not enrage or provoke reaction from colleagues. These actions no longer carry the consequences of a backlash from the international community. Instead, these actions may trigger condemnation quickly, followed by silence. Listen to this next line because it sounds sadly prescient. He wrote, as a result, Arab governments have been given free reign to continue silencing the media at an increasing rate. There was a time when journalists believed the Internet would liberate information from the censorship and control associated with print media. But these governments, whose very existence relies on the control of information, have aggressively blocked the Internet. They have also arrested local reporters and pressured advertisers to harm the revenue of specific publications. There are a few oases that continue to embody the spirit of the Arab Spring. Qatar's government continues to support international news coverage in contrast to its neighbors' efforts to uphold the control of information to support the old Arab order. Even in Tunisia and Kuwait, where the press is considered at least partly free, the media focuses on domestic issues, but not issues faced by the greater Arab world. They are hesitant to provide a platform for journalists from Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Yemen. Even Lebanon, the Arab world's crown jewel when it comes to press freedom, has fallen victim to the polarization and influence of pro-Iran Hezbollah. He goes on, the Arab world is facing its own version of an iron curtain imposed not by external actors but through domestic forces vying for power. During the Cold War, Radio Free Europe, which grew over the years into a critical institution, played an important role in fostering and sustaining the hope of freedom. Arabs need something similar. In 1967, the New York Times and The Post took joint ownership of the International Herald Tribune newspaper, which went on to become a platform for voices from around the world. My publication, The Post, has taken the initiative to translate many of my pieces and publish them in Arabic. For that, I am grateful. Arabs need to read in their own language so that they can fully understand and discuss the various aspects and complications of democracy in the United States and in the West. He goes on to write, if an Egyptian reads an article exposing the actual cost of a construction project in Washington, then he or she would be able to better understand the implications of similar projects in his or her community. And the final graph here of his final column, the Arab world needs a modern version of the old transnational media so citizens can be informed about global events. More important, we need to provide a platform for Arab voices. We suffer from poverty, mismanagement, and poor education. Through the creation of an independent international forum isolated from the influence of nationalist governments spreading hate through propaganda, ordinary people in the Arab world would be able to address the structural problems their societies face. That's it. The final column from Jamal Khashoggi submitted mm -hmm. the day before he disappeared. Every one of his words, we thought it was really important for you to hear exactly what he wrote, what was so mm -hmm. important to him, and frankly, the platform that the Washington Post 
gave him that he was not getting elsewhere. Joining us now is his editor, Karen Atia. Karen, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Your words, we wanted to bring it back in his words, to his ideas, to his thoughts. Tell me about the significance of publishing this column that you received just a day or two before he disappeared. Yeah, um, as I said in my note on the, the top of my column, or his column, um, yeah, we, we held out hope that he would come back, frankly. I mean, um, we knew after he disappeared in the Saudi consulate, we knew that, okay, the Saudis, sometimes they perhaps interrogate people, question people. Um, but as the days went on and it became increasingly unlikely um, that I would hear from him again, we decided uh, that it was important to recenter um, the story a little bit around him, around who he is. I mean, this this particular column just really does illustrate what he was most passionate about. Anybody who met him, even in our conversations, um, he really just felt that the Arab world needed um, just independent, uh, uh, trustworthy platforms for for these voices and for these journalists. And I think it was um, it's the reason why it was just so fitting. The idea that he likely um, might have been silenced because he wanted to to be free, um, right. because he wanted to push for reform. Um, it's a, a, a fitting end, and I think for Marand, it was it was the least we could do to publish this in Arabic as well, which we did um, to honor him and to to honor his his audience and to send a message, I think, um, to to the governments that he was speaking of that are increasingly yes, um, just smashing journalism across the Arab region. Yep, without. Uh, fear of consequence, it seems. Uh, one line in here particularly caught our attention. Uh, they seemed sadly prescient. He said that these actions, he was describing arrests, etc., no longer carry the consequence of a backlash from the international community. Instead, uh, they trigger condemnation, quickly followed by silence there. Did, did he ever speak to you about his own fears for his own safety, for speaking out like he has done, like he had done? So he, he would speak to me a lot about fears um, or about being pressured around his, his family and his children. Um, that's when he would send me messages saying he was sad and depressed and upset that uh, the Saudi government was in placing travel bans on, on his children to, to try to get to him. Um, as far as uh, you know, specific threats to his personal safety, I mean, I think nothing very specific other than um, that they had told him that, you know, okay, you can be in the States, you can write for whoever you want, but why does it have to be the Washington Post? And I knew uh, he was getting a lot of pressure because he was writing for us and, and perhaps even more so for doing it in, in Arabic. But, um, but I think, uh, you know, he labeled himself he, he, as like, you know, he didn't want to be a dissident. He, he right. rejected that label. He rejected this idea that he was some sort of revolutionary that wanted to bring down uh, the Saudi regime. Um, so, you know, this idea that, that they would try to silence even someone who was close to them at one point, I don't, I, he didn't behave like he was someone who was living in fear. You know, we had plans, we were having more meetings, we were discussing the future. Um, he wasn't acting like somebody who was um, in fear for his life at all, not with me. The, the, the one thing has become tragically clear, and that is that his voice has been amplified. Mm -hmm. through this yep. tragedy. His voice has been amplified. Um, again, that's why we felt it was so important to read read every one of his words. Um, and thank you for, for helping everyone remember what he stood for. Thank you, Karen. Thank you guys for that. Thank you for reading that. It means a lot yeah. to us here, too.